Welcome back. We're now going on to the topic of unemployment. And this question is from Tunde Shorinola in Lagos. There is a national crisis on our hands, and we are yet to realize it. For every job vacancy, over 10,000 resumes are received. Schools keep turning out graduates for jobs that are non-existent. To get a degree in Nigeria is like a visit to hell. And then to graduate and not find a job is simply unacceptable. What will your administration do to urgently tackle this crisis? Malam Ribado, would you like to start? Thank you. Uh, Tunde, you are right. We have a crisis right here with us. And uh, it's probably the biggest problem confronting us. It's one of the strongest reasons why I'm out. I, 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 want to part, I want to be part of the solution. Uh, the intention is whatever we are going to do as a government will be to address this problem of unemployment. The economic reforms that we intend to carry out will be such that the focus is to create jobs, employment. If we are going to fix electricity, I can assure you the main fundamental objective is to address the problem of unemployment. Because if you get electricity, you are opening up the economy. And certainly people will get job to, uh, jobs to do. We do intend to invest heavily in constructions. It is in our own manifesto. We do intend to build houses and roads. Through that, we, do, we are going to create jobs. We do intend to invest heavily in agriculture. Those areas are capable of giving employment or creating jobs opportunities almost immediate as you are doing them. Some of the things that we have seen today in our country is so sad. Uh, you know, the industry, for example, the oil industry, where as much as about 95% of our own revenue comes in, create less than 100,000 jobs. You use what you have to create jobs for your own people. The intention is to see the possibility of getting this money invested in the non-oil sector. And through that, you'll be able to open up and that you'll be able to get jobs but in the private sector particularly. Because the private be... sector is the engine of growth. The private sector is what can create, it's not government. Certainly, uh, this is the area to go. Oh, the private sector, because you talked earlier about investing and it just seems to me there's a finite amount of money that can be in a budget. And so all of these investments and all of these things, that where, where will the money come from? The money is there. Uh, <laughs> it's not just being applied pro properly now. It goes to the salaries of National Assembly members to buy aeroplanes for our president to continue to fly and the first lady. It goes to... <laughs> Thank you. That's right. why the money is going. Thank you, Madam Iban. Chief Mawati, would you like to... Yeah, the first thing is that it, it was just warming up into it. And uh, my idea about employment is that from the one, and we've already released this, I'm an expert in that, I'm a businessman. I've already created jobs for a lot of youths on the streets of Nigeria, at home and abroad. Uh, How? We will free all. Ovation International today <laughs> has taken, I have a job. I'm how many, how many, you know, how many people are employed by Ovation International? Oh, hundreds of youths. There is no city today where you don't have street vendors selling the magazine and they run into hundreds. But that's not even where I'm going. Where I'm going is that when you talk about diversification in the area of agriculture, we already have a plan. The 18 billion that we just spent on buying the private debt would have provided for me instantly 18 million uh, jobs. I would have been able to have, sorry, 200,000 jobs. And how will I do it? 1,800 millionaires would have been created from that money. How? I will tell you, a nephew of mine graduated, they couldn't get a job for three years. And he walked up to me and said, please, I need a job we couldn't get. I said, why don't you think of something? And he came up with a budget of just one million. Today he's cultivating 10 hectares of land in Osho State. He's employing 20 people. So if we had been able to free some of the money that we're spending on the personal comfort of our leaders, I can tell you that we would have been able to create 200,000 jobs instantly. Look, the kitchen of the vice president is going to be fitted with about 500 million. That's 2 million pounds. And I'm telling you, I own a very big restaurant, and I don't know of any restaurant in China or in India 
that even if you want to roast a whole cow in an oven, <laughs> it is a very so serious you, matter. You would use the money as capital. For so people the to money. Start so we will be able. I participate in the entrepreneur series on television, and you'll be able to uh, give it to this guy. Thank you, Chief I'm sorry, I'm not touching. Thank you, Governor Shekara. Well, thank you very much. I think there are two fundamental areas that need to be addressed when you're talking of unemployment. One, of course, is the private sector. And when you're talking of the private sector, there are two or three levels. Of course, you're talking of the higher level of the industrialization, bringing in investors to open up factories, manufacturing, and so on, because this employs quite a large number of people. The second segment of it is the middle level and the lower level of the economy. Uh, small businesses that you need to encourage. Government needs to create the environment. It's not government that will provide the funds. No government on earth will be in a position to provide all of the funds to employ people or to do investment. What government needs to do is to create a conducive environment that is healthy enough to attract both the foreign and the internal investors. This we need to do, like the power issue we've mentioned, and uh, the acquisition of plots, of land. Uh, the cost of doing business in Nigeria is quite, quite, quite high. It's expensive. We need to reduce that so that you need little money to be able to start off a small-scale business so that we can be employing two, three, four people. The other level is self-employment. And self-employment goes to the issue of skill acquisition, the training of the youth in different trades, uh, vulcanizing, uh, electronic repairs, computer uh, operation, name it. You have so many small, small businesses. I've done that in Kano. We have been able for the last eight years that we've been there, on the average, every year, we empower minimally 5,000 youth. We recruit them, we take them into different uh, trades, we train them and we give them the tools and support to go into businesses. Thank you, Governor Shakara. Now we sent somebody out on the streets to find out what young people really think about the issues that concern them. And we have a video of that which we would like to show you. population comprises of individuals under the age of 35 years old. 70% is a very large percentage. For far too long, Nigeria's youth have been the silent majority of this country. But things are about to change. Here's what Nigerian youth have to say on the streets. We seem to have a population of people with the wrong values. Forget about voting. Who are you voting for? He said whether I'm registered to select, and which I'm not the, among of those that select. It's for the high rankers, not for somebody like us. Because if you vote, your vote at the end of the day, the vote may not count. Okay. Female youth, we are the of a lot of things. Starting from the home, starting from my house, personally. I want to see the president as parent that is going to commit up to 26% of the Nigerian budget as being ascribed by the UN, UNESCO benchmark for education. Is there any of you over there that can give us 26% in our budget? Family should start embracing the fact that the same right I have is the same right my, female, my male brother has. It's the same right my younger brother has, the same right my elder brother has. We can't just fight corruption. We can't just fight corruption. And I say that modestly. I did not change, but not now with that kind of level of uh, corruption now. If we could work on power and generating constant electricity, I don't have to spend so much on um, buying generators, fueling those generators. Don't look at me because I am a skirt. Don't look at me because I am not like the way you people are. Just look at me of what stuff I am made of. You can catch the bigger thieves, but what about the petty thieves? How exactly would you deal with that? I have faith for Nigerians. 
Thank you. People in their own voices, so to speak. The young people don't just have comments. We also have young people who have questions. And we're going to take one question in a video from a young person. How do you as a candidate intend to bring together a new scheme in formulating policies within Nigeria to help build the country? Well, Amribadi, would you like to start? Yes. Uh, I have said it before, and I will say it again. My main reason of getting into politics is also to fulfill this ability for the young men and women of this country to have a chance to participate. Not just say that you give them, but also to be involved in the development and growth of our own country. This is why I'm here, and this is what I want to do, to connect with the young people, to fully get involved and engage. I've gone around the world, I've moved around, and I've seen what young men and young women are doing all over the world. There's no reason why we cannot do it in our country. Young people are modern. They have the tools, they have the means, and they have the knowledge. They can fully participate and indeed help to move this country forward. But is there, any, is there intend, any specific way that you would involve them intend, in your policies? I do intend to be part of a team of young people. I consider myself as a young person because I have young ideas. I have fresh ideas. And I, 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 I intend to pull young people in this country to participate. How do you do that? Get involved, not just to say that, okay, you are going, let them get into positions of responsibilities. Can you give me one example? For example, why don't you give a young person chance to head a commission on entertainment and, in the, uh, and the recording musical industries and so on? Give a young person and see what is going to happen. Maybe. Why don't you call a young person and say, today, you are going to be in the board of the Electrical com Commission of the Company of Nigeria. Give him a chance and see what he can do. Why don't you call? And the young person should be a person who is within his uh, the 30s you know, to 40s. Give them a chance. Give him a chance for him to run our aviation industry and see what he can do. We Thank yes. you. <laughs> Chief Momodi. Uh, I already have a good example. I'm the only one with a campaign manager, a national coordinator, he's only 26. And the man is sh shaking the whole world. <laughs> that tells you that I believe, if you look at the founding fathers of Nigeria, at what age did they start? So it's not just in the area of entertainment, it's also in the area of politics. And that's <laughs> why I like what the young guys are doing in this world today. Because this is serious. You see, so we shouldn't restrict them just to entertainment. What we're doing affects their lives. And the earlier, if I, one of my biggest regrets today is that I did not go into this in my 20s. Now at 50, we now have to contest with people in their 60s and possibly in their 70s. So we must get serious and catch them young. Once you do that, you will see that a lot of these things uh, would work for our country. Thank you, Chief Mumonde. Governor well, Shekhara. Th thank you very much. I think the questioner was asking how do we involve the youth in policy making. Yes. Uh, my idea, which I've already translated into practical terms in my state, is you encourage the youth to form associations of different kind of activities. Encourage them to be uh, coming together uh, with so many youth associations. Can you give me an example? For example, you have, for example, the Young Farmers Association, you have the uh, Young uh, Traders Association. You have the Young Mobile. Uh, but how does that how you does see, that then translate to the participating in your policy formulation? No, no, that's why I'm going to. If you form these associations, then the leadership of these associations will, from time to time, be interacting with government, which will be a channel through which you'll be involving them to participate. 
I don't quite agree with the approach with my, of my brother Nuhu. It's not just picking a youth on the street, just for the dancing to the gallery, appointing an inexperienced person. I don't mean to say all the youth are not experienced, but the important thing is, it's not just appointing the youth into positions that is important. The involvement of getting their ideas. Of course, some of them that are found to be fit in terms of their background and in terms of their training can be given positions of responsibility. But the important thing involving them in policy formulation will be more effective through the various youth organizations that you do have and you encourage them to form these organizations where they will sit among themselves, discuss issues, come up with suggestions, and government will create an atmosphere whereby the leadership of the various youth organizations will sit together under a certain umbrella. Thank you, Governor Shakara. We're going to take one more question from the video. While we wait for the video question, we have a general question which you might like to start to think about, which is, yeah. if you don't become president, <coughs> oh, we're about to take the question from the video now. Okay. <coughs> My name is 28 years old from Ben States. The question I have for the candidates is, what do you think about the economy, especially the value of the Naira as against the other currencies, other economies? How are you going to make it easier for us, young businesswomen, to do business with Chief Mamodi, would you like to start? Yes. Uh, you just have to improve on your income and make sure that as many people as possible are employed. And I'm, so, I'm happy that I have the chance to go back to that. Even Kano is saying that he was able to employ 5,000 people. I hope I got that right. Not to employ, it, to empower them. To empower. Give uh -huh. them skill. And I'm saying 5,000 is too little in a state that's supposed to be one of the largest. 5,000 every year. Yeah, every year. <laughs> it's, it's very small. I am insisting. <laughs> I am insisting that I'll be able to create 200,000 jobs immediately. If I can do it with one man, then I can do it with the others. There is, you see, we make it look like there is magic. Or that there is something wrong here that we cannot do what is being done elsewhere. When you talk about enabling environment, for example, we don't have a credit system here. It makes it difficult for anybody to function. At my level in Nigeria, I can't walk into any bank today and come out with a 50,000 naira loan. Whereas elsewhere, I can get an overdraft from my card of 3,000 pounds. So we must begin to do the right thing. The government yeah, what, in what, Nigeria what? is a bit lazy about doing something concrete. What would you do that's concrete? So one of the things we need to do, as I said, is that we must be able to empower our youth in the direction that you create that environment. Credit wow. is very important in every society. I know of smaller countries in West Africa where once you have a job and your employers can give you guarantees, you will get a car loan. You don't have to pay two, three years rent in advance because they are not going to collect your salaries in advance. In Nigeria, in fact, it's one of the things that I, I always tell him, that when you talk about corruption, corruption in Nigeria, part of it is that we're all under pressure. The, the, the video question was actually specifically about yeah. how you would help young people, how, what you would do about the inflation of the Naira and how you would help them to trade with other foreign countries. So, yeah. Governor Shikara, uh, Thank you very much. Like I think there's no way you can talk about improving the economy and affecting the value of the Naira, whether low or high, without talking about the productive sector. Uh, we must be a community that is productive. And when you're talking of the productive sector, that is talking about the industrialization I've mentioned, talking about the self-employment and the self-dependent. These are the areas that will improve the economy. It's not just arbitrarily fixing the value of the Naira. The value of the Naira will be 
uh, realized through what is the level of our production and what is the level of our consumption. If we all depend on consuming, bringing in whatever we need from outside the country, naturally the question of the value of our money uh, will keep uh, getting devalued because the exchange rate depending on everything coming in. But if you encourage people to be productive, not depending on whatever we bring in, and this is where I said earlier on, we're going to create an environment whereby the atmosphere will be good enough, relaxing some of the areas that will reduce cost of doing business, like the empowerment I've mentioned, uh, 5,000 is quite a, a big number in here. Don't forget, it's not just picking them on the street and empowering them. You need to put them into the meal of acquiring the skill. Some of these uh, skills will take three months, some will take four months, some will take five months for them to really get to the point of being self-reliant. Would you actively discourage importation then? Pardon? Would you actively discourage? Oh, certainly, certainly. We, as much as possible, discourage importation of those things that we really do not need. Things that we can manage with what we have in what we manage with it. Would discouraging also extend to banning? Extend? Would discouraging extend to banning? Would you Ext ban? Extend to what? To banning. Would you ban the importation of certain of things? Of course, when you're talking of discouraging, it depends on what laws you create. Some of them is uh, through enlightening the people to patronize locally produced materials. Some of it you have to legislate. Some of them are mere government regulations and control. Some of them are agreement with the various uh, manufacturing industries. So it's not just the banning as a one single thing. There are a lot of measures that you need to take to ensure that you control the level of consumption and interest of Nigerians on foreign materials. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, I think the question is about the value of our Naira. The value of Naira is tied to our own reserve. Usually, you know, if, if you see the strength of your own currency, it's directly uh, has a relation with how much you have in your own reserve. We must make sure that we have a good reserve for us to be able to maintain the value of our currency. How do you do that? You must work on the fiscal responsibility and discipline of your expenditure. You must operate a budget that is not going to be continuously on the deficit uh, level. You must find a way also of having a central bank that will be allowed to its own responsibility. Uh, monetary control and discipline is the responsibility of the central bank. You must have a strong regulatory authority and administration over the finance sector. Go, uh, then, of course, you have to, whatever you can do to change the economy that is almost 100% consumer economy to a pro productive one. Today, in our country, sadly, we consume everything. We hardly produce anything ourselves for us to sell, for us to make money. But the value of Naira is tied to your own reserve, how much you have as a country. I was part of an economic management team that worked and really got some money for the country. At the time when I left, when we left office, we had over $25 billion in our own reserve. And that is the money that kept this Naira at a low and balance for about two years. Now they have finished the money. They have completely. <laughs> and Thank you. You will see what is going to be the effect and impact. I'm going to have to talk to you short. Thank you, Madam Ribadi. We will take a break. And when we come back, Ebuka will be talking to the audience. live to the Shehu Musa Yaradua Conference Center at the What About Us presidential debate. Now we're getting a lot of questions and comments online thanks to Google Moderator. And I'd like to take a few of these ones which um, are directed at candidates unfortunately who are not here but I find them very interesting. Now the very first one from Eyi Temi Bego to General Buhari says, what are your thoughts on the growth rates of the Nigerian economy over the past 10 years and what policies will you pursue to achieve growth in non-oil sectors? And the second one from Babatunde Ademuyua from Lagos to good luck, Jonathan, the president. 
How do you plan to sustain the new federal university for every state policy? So far, you've established six. We would like to know the wisdom behind the establishment of these new universities, despite the fact that existing ones lack basic facilities, are underfunded, lack quality staff, and are perpetually on strike. Hmm. Unfortunately, I don't know how we're going to get the answer to that. Well, we're going to be taking questions from the audience. Um, the very first one from Victor, I believe. Where is Victor, please? Thank you very much, Victor. Um, my name is Victor Okaru, and I represent Joshuaville. And um, in the last couple of months, we've heard um, you candidates make a lot of promises during your campaigns. Now, um, if you had a chance to pick only one Basically, he's asking, if you had to pick just one issue to focus on, as, what would that issue be? And how do you plan to achieve it? Mr. Chekhov, please. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, if I will have to be pinned down to pick one issue that will be central to all other things, I would say it is exemplary conduct of the leadership. Because by the time you get the leadership to be upright, you get the leadership to live above board, the leadership to be very exemplary in every respect, because that is the key. No matter what you do in implementing any program, in running any government, so long as the head is not right, no matter the people you bring, the beauty of your program, leadership is the main thing. 80% of our problem, or even 90% of our problem, not only in government in Nigeria, in every organization, in every society, if you get it wrong in leadership, you are finished. So I think if there is one thing that I will want to concentrate on is to ensure exemplary conduct in leadership, because this brings in confidence in governors. And this is exactly what we have succeeded in doing in Kano. We've been able to show uh, it didn't begin with my time as a governor. If you look at the antecedents, if you look at the past records, what have the lifestyle of the leadership been? Uh, it's not just enough to tell people to be upright. You have to be upright yourself. And this is one thing that I think will be key to success in all our act of governance. Thank you very much. Yes, since he's already spoken about leadership, uh, which I believe is the basis of everything, I'll move to something else, and that's education. Uh, education is very, very key. Uh, in every society, you will never know your rights if you are not properly educated. Some of the things that we allow to happen in Nigeria today, if we had good education, and I'm sure we would have been able to tackle them effectively. Uh, I would definitely like to deal with the issue of education, making sure that our kids can have the kind of values. As, as I was growing up, uh, I remember reading about leaders. Po the politicians I knew, I knew at that time, if you go to Kenya, you heard of Jomo Kenyatta. If you went to Zambia, you heard of Kenneth Kaunda. If you came to Nigeria, you had political leaders who were grounded in education and were ready to fund education, and they were able to achieve a lot. But today, you have people, you don't have to go to school as such. If you like, you can forge certificates and then Later, people will just complain for the fun of it. I think our education is what has created a lot of problems for us, and we must do something urgently about it, but because there are just too many ignorant people who don't know what to do. People have given up hope on, their, on themselves, on their country, on their leaders. We just must do something. Madam Rebada, please. My own is unemployment. I will address the problem of unemployment. And uh, through that, uh, I will change a lot of things, the economy. Through addressing the problem of unemployment, I will get electricity for Nigeria. I will get more teachers for our schools. I will grow the private economy, the private sector. Inject money, improve the environment, get foreign direct investment to come in, and through that, you create jobs. If I'm going to address, like I told you, construction, houses, roads, I'm creating employment. Tech employment 
address it, indirectly you are addressing all the problems confronting us as people. That is an immediate, I believe, step that can change the lives of Nigerians. It's, it's vague to talk about leadership. It's something that you cannot really see. There is no immediate benefit that you can take out of it. Young people in this country want jobs. They want to be given opportunity for them to participate in the economy of our country and the growth of our country. Give them jobs, and you see the magic it will take. Education will take you 20 years daily for you to see any result. Through employment, you can change education because you can get teachers. You can train younger people. And through that, you are solving the problem of education itself. Education is the key. I mean, employment is the main thing. <laughs> you see that? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Very quick follow-up. No, if I... Key to you, we, <laughs> but I'm about to, just a quick follow-up. I, I, it seems to me also that the, all these ideas are really nice, but they also sound quite vague. So I'd like you to give one specific example, for example, of how when you say you would create jobs, and when you say you would do that by bringing in companies, how exactly, what would you do? What would you do to get these companies to come in? Improve the environment, the how? business environment. How do you do that? First and foremost, provide security, safety in the country. Make the business, uh, doing business uh, friendly. Today, we have a, on record that Nigeria has gone down from 134th state as well, a country you can do good business to about 138. It's going down. And then if you do not improve your environment, nobody will come in. How do you do that? Improve, for example, uh, the customs. Change the way you can bring in things into this country. Make it friendly. For you to import anything in this country today, it's a, such a huge and difficult tax. Make sure that capital is easy to come by. Make sure it's easy for ordinary people to approach a bank and get a loan. Uh, I think the, Thank the, you. I, I would like to respond to that. Go ahead, please. OK. So who exactly do you want to employ? Ignorant people? The 12 Look, million unemployed I am telling graduates. you that without education, you will have useless workers. And that is what is happening in most cases today. Our artisans used to be among the best in Africa. Today, people have to travel to Kotonu, to Togo, to go and bring artisans to fix the basic things. We don't have technical schools. Our polytechnics have gone down. You don't have college of education doing what they should be doing. And then you say you want to employ. You have, for me, it's like you are putting the car before the horse. Can oh, I Mr. Karai, would you I like to say yeah, something really to, quickly and then yeah, we'll have a very quick response? add on that. You see, when you address the issue of exemplary leadership, you're fighting corruption, you are bringing in judicious management of resources, all of these things they are talking about will be provided. If you don't get it right in the issue of leadership, you'll be wasting your time. Your money will be misused, your money will be misappropriated, there will be corruption, there will be misapplication of policies, wrong policies and insensitive policies will come in. So the issue of leadership, we are talking from experience. I don't want to say that, I, at the risk of sounding immodest, we have practicalized this in our state. We have done it and we have shown how exemplary leadership will translate a multiplier effect, not only at the level of the top leadership. Once the head is right, all the others will try to leave by example. It will trickle down the line. There will be judicious management of resources. There will be the right application and the right plan. Thank you, Governor Shikara. Thank you very much. We have another question from Alistair Shoyede. Very quick. Thank you very much, uh, Alistair Shoyede from the diaspora. My question basically will be relating to Nigerians outside the country. We know the image of Nigeria abroad. What will you do to change that? And apart from that, we know the Diaspora Commission bill, which is a, a bill that is in the National Assembly and already in the Senate. Finally, what will you do to make sure the Nigerians in Diaspora will be able to vote? At the end of the day, they contribute almost 50% of the budget that Nigeria spent a year, with more than, 12, 000, uh, more than $12 billion contributed on a yearly basis from the Nigerian Diaspora. Thank you. 
Chief Moro, please. Yeah, I have been a refugee abroad before. So I, I know the number of Nigerians that we have outside, and I've also had the privilege of going everywhere. And I know that an average Nigerian would really want to return home. And even if you can come home, at least you can do things uh, with Nigeria. Uh, there are so many bills. Every day people come to us and talk about bills before the National Assembly. I'm not sure that this National Assembly can handle a lot of these things because by the time you have to look at the issue of controversy among what it is costing us to keep them there, they will never be able to concentrate on the right thing. Uh, but seriously, I believe our government will be able to interact very well uh, with people in the diaspora. In fact, our economy today is largely sustained by them. Uh, I did a lot of work in the past with MoneyGram, with Western Union, and I know the kind of money that they send them. These people have families back home. They are more worried about the political situation in Nigeria. I believe we must find a way to cater for them so that they can participate effectively in the political process at home. But Chief Momodu, how exactly would you do that? Yes, what we need to do is to make sure that we lobby. It's, it's all, all over the world you have to lobby your National Assembly to be able to take the right decisions. We were hoping that this last amendment that we had, that such a thing would have been there, but for some funny reason, it was thrown out. So, but I'm hoping that we can bring it back on the front burner and uh, people will see the right reasons to do it. To allow those in diaspora to vote? Yes, please. Governor Shikara, well, would you I like think it's, it is one thing to want to have Nigerians in diaspora to vote. Uh, it's another thing to see it work practically. I think the number one thing we need to do is to go on this national identity issue. We need to identify ourselves. If you go to any of the Nigerian embassy today, they will tell you they don't have the total authentic list and records of all Nigerians living in that country. Because most of the Nigerians don't even care to go and report there. But if we are able to identify ourselves through the national identification uh, process, we will know who is a Nigerian, what is his identity, what is his code number, where is he living, where is he staying. Because unless and until you are able to have proper record of Nigerians living in Britain, for example, uh, how would you coordinate and ask the Nigerians living in Britain to vote? Uh, so I think... They would go the, to the embassy with their passports. Exactly. Well, uh, well, the passport is there quite all right, but the planning aspect is very important. Uh, when you're doing voters' registration, with all these kind of rackets in passports and so on, uh, I know we have a very long way to go. I am for diaspora Nigerians voting. I support that. But what I'm saying is that before we get to that stage, we need to create a situation whereby our records are up to date and properly maintained, both at home and abroad in the uh, embassy. There's nothing wrong anybody living in Nigeria. I've said this several times when I visit the Nigerians in diaspora, but how well are they doing there? What business are they doing? Thank you, Governor Shikara. Malam uh, I will pursue that goal. I will certainly make it possible uh, for Nigerians outside to participate and forge. It's a law issue. We will pursue it. We will get it in a way that the legally Nigerians will be entitled to those who are living outside to vote. That is what, certainly one of the priorities of the government that we intend to lead. Two, I also engage them. We will bring them into government. Uh, how do you do that? Get them into positions. Give them chance for them to participate. It's not just talk. Like what I said earlier, I said that I will bring young men and young women into government. Give me responsibilities. There is nothing wrong to have a smart young man in his status to be a minister, to be an advisor. Get the diaspora also to come and participate in government. Encourage them to think about home. Come back, whatever you have, if it is money, invest home. Improve the environment, like I said. Luckily, I'm also a member of that community. I'm part of it. You're a member of the I diaspora. I know A to Z. You're a member of the diaspora. Oh, sure. I'm ah. one of you.
I'm, I'm not a member of the. How are you a member of the diaspora, Malami Baji? Yes, how, are, how are you a member of the diaspora? I, I lived in, in outside for about two years, and, <laughs> and I can assure you, I, I I was part of the community very closely, and uh, that made me very proud Nigerian. It was that opportunity I got to know really how great we are as people. We were, we were amazing people. When I was in the UK, I was part of the community. When I got back to the US, I was a member, a very active one. We participated in all our activities, and we love Nigeria. They are some of the best we have. We have another question here from Mary. Calls, Julie observes. My name is Mary Kua Eyong, and I'm representing Kai and Kudras Initiative for Democracy. Procedures candidates, I would like to ask, you've all spoken well that in time past we have been kept ignorant of power and other sector operations. What are your plans to keep us in loop, that is with the youth and the general public, in loop of your tangible implementation of these your plans and the results as you achieve them per time during your tenure, if you so happen to be? And how do you intend to carry out your monitoring and control strategy to at least achieve 70% of all these your goals by the end of your tenure? Thank you. Malam Rivaldi, please. We'll start uh, with you. Can you repeat the question because it was... Basically, <laughs> how, how do you plan on running an open government open to government. make the public participate and know on a daily basis or monthly or whatever it is what the government is up to? And secondly, how do you plan to implement at least 70% of these things you have promised us today? It's very critical. That is where the difference will be. Ability for you to run an open, transparent, a very accountable government. Luckily, this is an area that I can say I am fairly well, really, grounded. I, 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 I've been in public service for 25 years. I had a chance for me to create an agency of government, and it was run open, transparent, and we got results. Those are things that will make a difference. Uh, for you to get uh, results in government, you must be able to take your own interest, selfish interest, out of it and make it something that is all open and collective. That's the intention. That's what we intend to do. For you to get results, if you have your own plan, you must strategize. You must have whatever you want to in, uh, implement ready. Give timeline. Be disciplined ability for you to understand those things and carry out properly uh, in a way that Nigerians and everybody will see will be the difference. Most important for you to get a team. Team of competent hands. I've already started doing that. From my choice of the vice president, you could see the sign of things ahead of us. I've got a very competent private sector person. Someone who really showed that he can do and deliver. We do intend to bring quality people across. Chief Mwadu, please. Uh, whatever people promise, politicians make a lot of promises, I agree with you, uh, but you also have to look at pedigree. You have to look at records. And I'm proud to say that I have an excellent record of performance. Uh, I was a teacher in 1982-83, in the school, every student wanted to attend my class because they knew I would deliver. At the age of 30, I was the highest paid editor in the whole of Nigeria, two years after arriving in Lagos. My dream was to be a teacher and marry a teacher and live happily thereafter. <laughs> Unfortunately, I couldn't get a job, so I was forced to come to Lagos. And I worked very hard within two years. In 1992, I was the founding editor of Leaders and Company, what is known today as this day newspaper. And you can see, I recruited most of the people who started that newspaper, and today it is the best newspaper in Africa. You, you will agree with me. In 1993, I was a campaigner for Chief Moshuda Biola during the June 12 presidential elections. Today, I'm a presidential candidate myself. It tells you <coughs> that I learned a lot from that. In 1995, I was in exile. I, he said he spent two years. I spent three years. So I'm a senior refugee. <laughs> and, <laughs> and within those three years, <clears throat> by dint of hard work, I was able
to build a global business out of nothing. Thank you very much. Well, Madam. I think my sister is asking how do we run an open government. Uh, one of the characteristics of giving good governance, of course, is freedom of expression and accountability. These are the only factors that you can apply in governance to have an open government. Open government meaning that people talking to the government and government talking to the people. That is involving them in the process of telling government, criticizing government, assessing government, and government telling them what it does. So we'll create an avenue whereby people will talk to us, there will be freedom of expression. Today, go and ask anybody in Kano, it is one of the freest environment where all shades of opinion are allowed to go onto the media. We have the state media. I have never interfered in the state radio, in the state television, in the state newspaper of Triumph. For eight years, I've never dictated for one moment what this media will do. And we allow the opposition to go in there and speak their mind and express their views. And then for accountability, at the end of every month, for the last eight years running, my commissioner for finance will go over the media, tell the people of Kano how much we have earned that month in terms of revenue, external and internal, what have been expanding, how much has been spent. So this will give you openness and involvement in government. Thank you very much. Question. Another question here from Blossom. Thank you very much. Once more, um, thanks for inviting me here. All through this evening, something has just been ministering to me. We are only talking to enlightened youths. The elitist youth, if I can use that word. You know, there are some people in the creeks, in the rural areas. How do we intend to let them know that you can get education and become a leader and get employed when they never even see full shop? Yeah. As in poverty is like what it's, is, is their med is the major headache they have. The question now is how do you intend to tackle poverty. Thank you. Madam Shekara, please. Well, I think coming back to what she was saying, you see, I had said earlier on one of the best ways to involve the youth is to allow the youth to get organized into various associations. If you go back to the rural areas and encourage them, for example, in the farming area, we introduce what we call farmer groups. We have so far created over 25,000 farmer groups throughout the state, across the state. And we encourage them to participate in the policy of agriculture in, deep into the villages. We'll send in the extension workers there into the rural areas, get them organized, give them some guidance how to form association of 10, 20, 30, 50 youth among themselves, how to keep record, how to hold meetings. In this way, you get the leadership. You don't have to invite all of these young men in the creeks, in the rural areas, to the city. Get the leadership of the youth to come and participate. In that way, you'll be able to enlighten them and allow them to participate. Madam Ribaudi, please. Oh, OK. Uh, you can change and improve the lives of the ordinary people, including those who are in the villages through investment in agricultural sector. Most of our people are in need, are involved. Whether you are in the creeks, you probably will be a fisher person. If you are up there in the north, you might be just a farmer. Or if you are a full animal, you are following your cows. Invest in those areas in a small way. How do you do that? You could do it through this support for small scale uh, enterprises. Get capital available and bring it to their doorsteps. Simplify the process make it accessible and it is doable it's not going to be too much and we have tried it before but corruption did not allow us to succeed this time it is going to be a different thing altogether because we do intend to make sure that the money that we have is going to be used judiciously properly and it is going to get to the ultimate on, uh, target that we want the money to get to some of these are Chief Mwari, the, please. <laughs> the best way i insist to improve the quality of life of any human being is education. 
My mother was a stark illiterate. My father was a laborer. But my mother knew the value of education and insisted I must go to school. Today, I'm running for the highest office in Nigeria. Education is key. It's not just about creating and making sure that if you were selling cows, the child of a cattle rearer can become the president of Nigeria. And the only way that can happen is through education. Of course, we will create a lot of job opportunities for them in areas that are not even so funky, like the ones they've described. I know I've gone around, I've spoken to a lot of these rural people. Traditional medicine is one area that we have not fully tapped in Nigeria. In, in China, we all hear about acupuncture today, but all of us grow up having agumu, agu, and all those things. And I believe we can develop those areas. Thank you very much, Chief Mawadi, for those interesting points. We are bursting with questions in the audience here today, but of course we are constrained by time and we can't take all of them. So back to you, Chief Mamanda. Thank you, Ibuka. We are now at the stage of taking final closing statements from the candidates. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time, so they have only 30 seconds each for their closing statements. Malam Ribadu. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is our time. We have an opportunity. In two weeks' time, we have this one chance, one in a million, for us to turn our country around. We can do it. I'm one of you. I want to be part of this team that can change our country. It is our time. Young men and young women are changing their countries all over the world. It is time for us to change Nigeria. We have this opportunity. Let's go for it. Thank you, Malam Ribadi. Chief Momoji. Fellow Nigerians. <laughs> <laughs> I have this great opportunity to appeal to you that in two weeks' time, you will be go going out to vote. It is your right. When you sit down at home and fail to exercise that right, then the type of leadership we have will continue. You know my pedigree. I've worked, and you have seen the results, and I assure you that we will not let you down. Thank you, God Chief bless Mama Nigeria. Dear. Governor well, thank you very much. About 70% of Nigerian population is constituted by the youth. So I think the youth has, have a very serious challenge. We are clamoring for free, fair, and credible election, and this is a challenge to the youth. You must see it as your own fight, you must see it as your own struggle, and don't let the nation down. Please, I am appealing to the Nigerian youth to see this as the time to ensure that we have credible election. Thank you, Governor Shakara, and thank you all for coming. It's been an absolute pleasure for me moderating this debate. Thank you, thank Malam Ribadu. Thank you, thank Chief you. Momodu. Thank you, thank Governor you. Shakara, for honoring our invitation and for engaging with the youth. And we would like to ask you to shake hands with each other. Yeah. And well, thank you all very much. Yes, yes. Well, well done. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. National anthem. National anthem.